So the question is, do we have any data about how, how long a, a particular fault zone might be active? Um, and the answer is, it, it can be anything from, well, it's always measured in millions of years, for starters. Um, the San Andreas Fault has been active for about 30 million years at this point. There's no reason to believe that it will stop being active um, for many tens of millions of years. The only reason that a, a, um, a plate boundary will stop being active is if these two plates stop moving with respect to one another. And the only way for these two plates to stop moving with respect to one another is that somewhere else in the globe, there's some kind of continental collision. And when two continents collide, they, they can't go any further, and that's what stops the motion. Okay? So that's a very, very long way off. We, I don't want to go too far down this path. We, we will talk about plate tectonics as a whole a little bit later. Um, but this is a long-term process. It's not stopping anytime soon. Yeah. What's the most active fault in the world? What does that mean to be most active? The most slip? The most earthquakes? The most everything. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I can tell you regions that have a very high seismicity rate and places where there are very fast um, plate losses. So the, the motion of uh, the Pacific plate with respect to North America is five centimeters per year. So every year, North America moves five centimeters in this direction with respect to the Pacific plate. Uh, plate motion vectors get up to about 10 centimeters per year. So about twice as fast as that. So California is pretty active, but it's certainly not the most active part of the world. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. So the question is, how do you determine slip that happened 11,000 years ago? Hold that thought. Any other questions? All right, let's keep going so we can answer the question. Okay, I just want to fill, complete the, the process again. We'll talk about earthquake probabilities in more detail in the final third of the class. But now that we sort of recognize, oh, I didn't say, so, so the red lines are the faults, and then the gold circles are earthquakes. These are mostly small magnitude earthquakes that are going on on these faults on a daily basis. We have you know, magnitude one and two earthquakes every single day in California. We just don't feel them. And so you can see that the earthquakes are obviously distributed along the faults. Although interestingly, there are some parts of the fault that have absolutely no seismicity, like this section of the San Andreas, for example. So we, we know the faults. We can see the small magnitude earthquakes on many of the faults. And when we put these things together, we can come up with an estimate of the likelihood of a damaging earthquake on these different faults. And, and so these are what we call earthquake probabilities. The likelihood of a major damaging earthquake in the Bay Area over the next 30 years is 60 2%. Okay? The way to think about this is that in the next 30 years, there is a, you know, a 2 in 3 chance that we'll have a major damaging earthquake in the Bay Area. When I say a major damaging earthquake, we mean an earthquake that's great, that's a magnitude 6.7 or greater. That is not the Napa quake. The Napa quake was a 6. Okay? 6.7 is used in these estimates because that was the magnitude of the Northridge earthquake in Southern California. The Loma Prieta earthquake was a magnitude 6.9. Okay? So there's a 2 in 3 chance, so more than 50% chance, that there'll be a major damaging earthquake in the next 30 years. The reason that these probabilities are always done over 30 years is because that's the typical duration of a mortgage. Okay? Okay, an appropriate reaction down here. So when you buy your house and you get a 30-year mortgage, you know, and if you buy it in the Bay Area, you now know that there is a two in three likelihood there will be a major damaging earthquake while you own that house. Okay? So we're trying to kind of link the science to the kind of practical reality of living in the Bay Area by using that kind of duration. Yeah? So the question was, when we have the Napa earthquake, of course, Napa earthquake, I call it a small earthquake, but it did have some slip associated with it. And so does that increase or decrease the likelihood of another earthquake? It does decrease it, but only by a really small amount. So the Napa quake was actually not on any of these map faults. The Napa quake was on... Um, I forgot the name of the fault. I think it's the Napa Valley fault, I think it's called. But it's a, small, a smaller fault, a known fault that runs sort of right about here. Basically, it's immediately west of Napa and Vallejo. So a smaller fault here. It was a magnitude 6 earthquake. I don't remember the maximum slip. Do any of you guys remember what the maximum slip on the fault was? It was centimeters, I think. I think the maximum slip on the fault was just a few centimeters. So in terms, so it, it, it's released some of the strain. Remember that we have to accommodate, on these faults, we have to accommodate 5 centimeters per year motion between the Pacific and North America. The total amount of slip on the Napa fault that was this section here was a few centimeters. So it has a very small impact. Okay? The 1906 earthquake that ruptured the San Andreas fault had about 6 meters of slip. Okay? So this little Napa quake really has, doesn't, do very, doesn't do very much to change the earthquake likelihood. So the, the five centimeters per year, the Pacific plate is moving continuously with respect to North America, okay? And so the strain is, is building up on these faults on a daily basis. So nothing is stopping this plate. This plate's gonna keep moving five centimeters per year. And that builds up the strain on these faults, and then periodically the fault can't take it anymore and it ruptures. Okay, I'm gonna keep, one last question, I'm gonna keep going. These sort of details we are gonna talk about in more, you know, I like answering questions, but I wanna make sure we get through this material. Yeah. So you mean if, if we rupture this part of San Andreas in Northern California, what does that mean for the part in Southern California? Um, so if we only rupture this northern section, then that doesn't change the likelihood of an event down in Southern California. Southern California still has to accommodate this five centimeters per year. And, uh, and if we have a big rupture here, then that's accommodated a lot of that motion in Northern California, but it's really not done anything to accommodate it in Southern California. Yeah, we can't push all our earthquakes down for Southern California, unfortunately. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so that's earthquake probabilities in the game. We will come back to this and talk about this in much more detail in the last third of the class. Okay, but back to faults. Sort of, so, so when we talk about faults and whether we think faults are active or not, here's an example of a fault that clearly is active. This is a running track, um, and you can just make out that clearly something has gone on here. Okay, it's sort of difficult to see, but clearly the, the running track has been disrupted. So obviously this has happened since they built the running track. Um, if we kind of actually zoom in, this is what's actually happened here. Okay, so this is not a strike slip fault. This is not a San Andreas type of fault. Clearly there is vertical motion here, vertical motion of about a meter and a half, I would estimate. And so these photographs actually are of damage caused by the 1999 Chi earthquake in Taiwan. And Taiwan is a, um, is a subduction environment, so these plates are colliding with one another, and as a result you have compression, and when you have compression between these plates you get vertical motion, um, and you get push-ups, and, and this, is, this is obviously um, what has happened here. So clearly, this fault is active. Same, more photos from the same earthquake. Um, this bridge obviously has fallen down, but what's actually interesting here is this part of the photo. Um, you can see there's essentially a river, which is the same, same uh, place obviously, there's a river, and now there's a waterfall. This is a brand new waterfall following the earthquake. Okay? So the river just all looked sort of nice and smooth and flat like this before the earthquake. The earthquake occurred, um, and there was nine meters of vertical offset um, right along the fault. This is the fault running here. So in this particular location there was nine meters of offset. At that school there was about one and a half meters of offset. Okay? 
Um, so back to our San Andreas fault. So this shows the motion that occurred in the 1906 earthquake. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen pictures like this. The classic sort of, you know, fence that has been offset. This road was built straight, but the 1906 earthquake, the San Andreas fault ruptured right through here and then also right through here and offset um, this fence. What's kind of nice here is you can see how this is sort of has bent. So this, this offset was accommodated over some distance, maybe a couple of meters here. In this case, it's literally just sheared the fence and, you know, the fence just stops here and continues here and you can see exactly what the offset was. So this is about, you know, in all of these photos, we're looking for markers. Somebody asked, how do you know um, how much uh, motion there has been? Well, you have to find some markers. In this case, we're using obviously man-made markers. They built a fence and presumably they built it nice and straight. And we can now see that it's been offset, I know, by maybe a meter and a half in this case, maybe a meter um, in this particular case. Okay? Um, so this kind of comes back to the question about the Pacific and, and uh, North America moving relative to one another and how we build up stress on the faults. Okay? So this is what we call the earthquake cycle. The earthquake cycle just goes around and around this process. So we start with our two blocks of rock on the two sides of the San Andreas Fault. Somebody's rather conveniently built a nice straight wall for us across this fault. This is the Pacific plate over here, and this is the North American plate over here. So this is moving up to the left, and this is moving down to the right. Right lateral strikes at fault. And as time progresses, that North American plate and Pacific plate, they just keep moving past one another. They're not stopping, waiting for an earthquake. They just keep on moving. And so you end up deforming um, the plate boundary like this. So you can see you get this sort of S shape to the, the fence because this has moved at five centimeters. This is obviously schematic. But this has moved at five centimeters per year. This has moved at five centimeters per year, and the bit in the middle has not. So you've deformed the middle piece. Okay, it's like an elastic medium. It's not this solid rock as we think about it. It deforms a little bit. But once you've moved so far, the stress on this fault plane, the fault plane can no longer withstand that stress. So the forces that are holding that fault plane together can no longer withstand the stress that's built up, and it just pops and it slides. And obviously, when it slides, that S shape disappears. And now we're back to the straight fence, but there's a gap. There's an offset in the middle of the straight fence. And so we're now back to the starting point again. We continue to build up stress, build up stress until um, it slips. Okay. So this is the earthquake cycle. It's inevitable. It continues to operate. The earthquakes will continue to reoccur. That's the point of the earthquake cycle. And this whole concept, um, what's called elastic rebound theory, was actually developed in the studies that followed the 1906 earthquake. We'll talk about that in about a week. Okay, any questions about this? This is a key concept that you need to understand when it comes to the earthquake cycle. Yeah. So the question was, do all three steps occur in a short time period? So this process of building up the strain here takes a long time. Yeah, there are places in California where people have put out markers. Now, the actual horizontal distance over which this strain builds up is significant, many kilometers. But people have put out markers, and you can actually see them deforming. Well, no, no, no. So this builds up over a period of hundreds of years. So this is going on right now, right where we're sitting. Okay? So over a period of hundreds of years, this strain will build up, and this sort of S-shaped deformation occurs. And then one afternoon, it pops, and that's the earthquake. Yeah, well, this is, um, this is this cartoon is for a transform boundary, but exactly the same thing happens with normal faults with these vertical faults as well. Yeah. Um, well, no, there are places where we can see, well, so, no, so the, the issue there is that the, the length scale that you see this deformation over is kilometers. So if you build a building like this one, for example, the actual degree to which, um, I'm confused, where's the fault? Fault's over here. So the actual degree to which this side of the building has moved with respect to this side of the building due to this gradual buildup is tiny. Okay, because in order to be able to see significant deformation, you have to look over a few kilometers. So you don't usually see um, the buildings being strained by this kind of buildup. Now, I just want to say that there is another type of buildup called creep that we see on the Hayward Fault that does cause strain. And so I'm just going to say that now, we'll come back to that on Thursday. But this kind of strain um, isn't going to cause deformation to buildings for the most part. These are great questions. Any other questions? All right. And so, so this is the earthquake cycle. This is now we're plotting a uh, crustal strain. So this is the gradual buildup of the strain in the crust. As you go from this situation to this situation, we're building up the strain in the crust. So that with time, this is time on the horizontal. You gradually build up the strain, and then an earthquake occurs, releases the strain, releases the stress, um, and then you start to build up the strain again, and you have another earthquake, and so, so on and so forth. And so the number of earthquakes is basically no earthquakes. When that major earthquake occurs, you then have a large number of aftershocks. It decays over some period of time, then it's quiet again. The strain's built up, big earthquake, and then aftershocks, and it, it decays with time. Okay? So this is a continuing cycle. Right? So one of the ways that we try and estimate the recurrence interval of earthquakes on faults, such as the Hayward fault, for example, is to go back and, uh, and try and identify, try and date when the last few earthquakes have occurred and see what the average recurrence interval. And so this is a, a sequence of major earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault, not on the Hayward Fault. And so this is just sequence number, you know, the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. And then this is the date, okay, the year 2000. So this is going back in time. And you can see that the, the horizontal distance between these points is fairly constant. So you could go and calculate an average, and that's how you would come up with a recurrence interval. So the, the earthquake on the fault, so this is over, um, well, let's go back 1,000 years. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven earthquakes over 1,000 years, okay? So the recurrence interval is about 150 years. But you can also see that it's very variable. There's earthquakes very close in time here and more distant in time here. So there's big uncertainties on those recurrence intervals. It's important to recognize that. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, whether, why is it that this is curved rather than just being straight? I think that was somebody's artistic license. I don't interpret that. I think a better way of drawing this diagram would be to have a straight line, vertical drop, straight line, vertical drop. Yeah. The <laughs> question was, if somebody's living here, what happens to their property? That's a great question. Um, and it's largely unresolved. When we go on the second field trip, we'll actually be looking at landslides on the Berkeley Hills. And there are examples where people's homes have slid down the hillside to the degree where half of their home is now on somebody else's property. And so there's, a, there's currently an ongoing legal action to try and figure out who owns what. This is a problem. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so the, somebody asked a question, how do you tell if a fault was active or how far? What was your question again, remind me? Okay, how do you determine the slip that happened 11,000 years ago or how quickly a fault is slipping over the last 11,000 years? And the answer is geomorphology. Okay, so this is a map of a place called Wallace Creek. Okay, so there's high topography over here and there's low topography, a plain over here. And you can see the geomorphology, the creek. This is the creek bed coming down here. So which way is the river flowing? Downhill, good answer. Which way is downhill? Somebody speak up. South. When you say south, you mean down, I take it. So, so yeah, so the creek is going in this direction. And then what you can see here is that the, the, these creeks merge. That's how you tell that the flow is going down on the slide. And clearly, there's this big bend. And you can see that this big bend in the creek, there's another bend here. And you can see there's some sort of straight line. Needless to say, this is a fault. So what's the motion on this fault? What's the nature of the,
who thinks it's right lateral? Okay, well, only about a third of you voted. That's not a good sign. This is, in fact, right lateral. You stand on this side, you look over here, it's moved to the right. And again, if you stand on this side, look over here, it's also moved to the right. Okay, so this is a right lateral fault. This is, in fact, the San Andreas fault in, in central California. Um, and so what's going on here is that when a creek first cuts its bed, of course, it just goes straight downhill. And going straight downhill, in this case, means going towards the bottom of the slide. And so it would start like this. But then when there's right lateral motion on the fault, this these two creek channels get offset. Okay, and once this channel gets offset too far, it just cuts another creek. So that's what's going on here. This creek channel is being bent. It goes a longer fault, and then it continues down here. And this over here is an old abandoned channel. So this channel here used to line up with this piece here. Okay. So, that's, so this is sort of the geomorphology. This is how we map the geomorphology along the faults. And we can see evidence that there's been motion. So that's the first half of the question. So we now can see evidence that there's been motion along this fault. And then the second piece is to try and figure out when this motion occurred. Okay? So again, this, this little section here is this section. It's sort of highlighted. So this is Wallace Creek today. It bends, runs along the fault, continues down here. And this is the Wallace Creek abandoned channel shown, uh, shown in purple here. And there are various other geomorphic features along here that tell us it's a fault, what we call a linear ridge right here, what we call a sag pond um, uh, over here. Um, let's keep going. So, so here's a picture of Wallace Creek. So this is actually a picture from here. So I'm up on the high elevation. This is the creek coming down. The San Andreas Fault runs along here. So the creek comes down, wraps around the corner, and then continues on down the plain. What you can just see in the background, that's the old abandoned channel. Okay? And then these, uh, these ridges and these sag ponds, these occur when there's slight offsets in the fault. So when there's a slight offset in the fault where this side is being pushed against this side, you get a, get a ridge. And when, the, when it's the other way around, you get a sag pond. And we'll talk about this more on the field trip, but so these sag ponds and these ridges are also evidence of an active fault. Okay? So then how do you add time? So now we know that there's deformation, we know that it's active, or we see evidence that it's moved. How do we add time to it? So in the case of river channels, this is the most popular way of estimating how active faults are today in California. And what people do is they go and they find places like Wallace Creek where there are these abandoned river channels, and then they trench the channel. And what they're looking for is um, uh, material that they can apply radiocarbon dating to. So pieces of charcoal. It has to be organic material that have carbon in it. Okay? So pieces of you know, wood, things like this. Um, and then they can do radiocarbon dating, and they can map out. So this is a map in, uh, of where all of these channels are, um, the, the old channels associated with Wallace Creek, far more than you can actually see in the geomorphology today. When you dig trenches, you can identify them. Um, and then this just shows the positions um, of, the, uh, uh, of these channels. And then you date the charcoal, and you take the oldest date. Right? What you want to know is the last time that a channel was active. Okay? So, I mean, sorry, you want to... Uh, well, it's the oldest. Yeah, no, sorry. You want to know when the channel started to be active. So you take the oldest material in the channel. Okay? So you take these multiple uh, uh, dates from the channel. You can measure the total offset. Okay? And you take the oldest material from the oldest channel. And so now you have the total offset, and you have the total amount of time it's taken for that offset to occur. So in this particular case, you can't get it from this. But in this case of Wallace Creek, the total offset is 130 meters. And the oldest material is 80, uh, sorry, 3,800 years old, 3,800 years. So that means that the total slip rate is 130 meters in 3,800 years. And that comes out to be 3.4 centimeters per year. Now, I told you that the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate are moving at a rate of 5 centimeters per year. Wallace Creek is moving at a rate of 3.4 centimeters per year. So that means that there's another 1.5 centimeters of slip that's occurring on another fault that's parallel to the San Andreas Fault at Wallace Creek. Okay? So this Wallace Creek, the fault, the San Andreas Fault that runs through Wallace Creek, accommodates the majority of the relative motion, plate tectonic motion, but there's still motion going on elsewhere as well. Okay? And we're going to look at another example doing this specifically on the Haywood Fault. Okay, so just uh, to finish up quickly, um, we talked about all of these things. I just want to give you some classifications. We talked about horizontal slip and vertical slip. There are two types of faults that accommodate vertical slip. We call them dip slip faults. Dip again is this. The dip is the dip of the, um, of the plane, and dip slip means we're moving in the direction of dip, i.e. a vertical fault. And a normal fault is one where you have a block like this and you pull it apart. So you have a, if you have a block like this and you pull it apart, then one of the, this block is going to slip down relative to this block, um, and that's what we call a normal fault. So a normal fault occurs in an extensional environment. So where you have plate, a plate tonic situation where you're pulling two plates apart, you get normal faults. Okay? And so the, what you see is subsidence. You see basin formation, um, and the way that we describe this is with a strike and the dip um, of the, the fault. Um, Oh, before I show you that. So here's a photograph of an example of a normal fault. So this is the fault plane. So essentially this block here has dropped down with respect to this block up here. Um, and so the relative motion looks something like this. We're pulling these two blocks apart, and so one block drops down um, with respect to the other. I'm going to go through these very quickly. These definitions are dealt with very nicely in the textbook. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because this is also dealt with in your textbook. So how we describe stri striking dip is just a way of describing the orientation of a fault plane. Okay, the second type of dip slip fault is a reverse fault. So it's the same. It looks exactly the same as that other block, but the difference now is it's a compressional environment. And so this block is being pushed up on top of this block over here. All right? So these compressional environments are where we have mountain building. So wherever there are mountains, there are reverse faults. So the fault that I showed you in Taiwan um, was a reverse fault, okay? And so that's why Taiwan is a big high uh, mountain associated with it. Oh, and there's some photos. And so this is, again, just a little animation to show you the kind of motion. So this is a reverse fault. And then finally, the third category is the San Andreas fault type, strike slip faults. And in strike slip faults, the motion is primarily horizontal, okay? And so one block moves laterally with respect to the other. So we call these translational environments. San Andreas, Hayward faults um, are examples of this. And these faults are either right lateral or they're left lateral. And in the case of the vast majority of faults in California, they are right lateral strike slip faults because they're all accommodating the motion between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. The majority, not all, but the majority are. Okay, so Wallace Creek is obviously a right lateral fault. Stand here, you look over here, um, it's moved uh, to the right. Okay, and then finally, of course, it's not like all faults are this beautiful. They're either dip slip or they're strike slip. Of course, they're usually some kind of combination. We call that a blick a blick slip. So there's both strike slip and, um, and dip slip type, type of faulting going on. And so on the San Andreas fault, for example, it's primarily a horizontal fault, a translational fault, a strike slip fault. But there is a little bit of vertical motion. That's the reason that the Berkeley Hills are here. Because although the Hayward fault is also primarily strike slip, there's a little bit of compression across the Hayward fault, and that causes a little bit of dip slip, which is what generates.